We're going to go to the book of St. Luke. Book of St. Luke, chapter number 16. St. Luke, chapter number 16. Once again, here in the book of St. Luke, chapter number 16, we were sharing with you last week of how you take chapter number 15 and chapter number 16 and get a better understanding, as I say, what Jesus was actually getting at during these last two chapters, these couple chapters. And uh, the essence of it is that the Pharisees were supposed to be stewards of the things of God. Paul talked about it. He said that we are stewards of the mysteries of God, talking about every believer. In other words, every believer has an advantage about God that the world does not know anything about. Amen. They don't know that he is a way maker, but we know that. Amen. They don't know he's a healer, but we know that. Amen. They don't know he's a deliverer, but we know that. Amen. They don't know that he can give them a breakthrough, but some of us know that. Amen. I'm just tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of things that we know that about God that the world does not know. And Paul talked about it. He says that if you're going to be a steward of the mysteries of God, you've got to be faithful. Yeah, yeah. And this is what's most important in all of our lives. And any time that you're faithful at anything that God has promoted, then God will bless you. Yeah. He will bless you. Yeah. Faithful with the information that you have about God. Faithful at doing what? Faithful at living it, faithful at modeling it, faithful at sharing it, faithful at pronouncing it or declaring it. And so God wants us to be active in making sure that people that don't know anything about him, they, in your circle, they get a chance to know something about him. And it doesn't mean you have to preach to him every Sunday. It doesn't mean that. It means you need to live the life before them so that when they are in trouble, they know who to come to. Even if you never preach to them, they'll know because they've been watching your life. And then when they do come, then you share the mysteries that you're aware of as a steward. And so here we get into chapter number 16. Jesus makes this statement. He says that the children of the world are wiser than the children of the kingdom. And we were looking at it to say, okay, why did he say that, uh, that they were wiser than we are? And uh, this is a, in the parable, chapter number 16. We had looked at this rich man and this steward, and we begin to examine some of the things that the steward and the rich man did. One of the things is that the rich man put the steward in the position. But he didn't tell him that now that you're in this position, one day I will hold you accountable for what you do. Just like God don't tell us. He said, I'll call you into this, and I anointed you to do that. He, he don't go into the accountability of what he gives you to do, your position. But this is where it's in the word of God, so we recognize that there is a sense of accountability to everything that we're going to do. We will give an account. For what we do. The scripture even talked about it that we'll give account for every word that we speak. In other words, some words that we speak, they are powerless. They are meaningless. They have no effect. They do nothing. And we will give account for all those words that does nothing. Because God gives us the power of words to change and to make an effect in somebody's life. Amen. This is why it always talks about when we get together, we need to say things to encourage one another. Amen. To promote what the kingdom of God is doing and to, to share our experiences, to help people, help people with the words that you say. You may not be able to go overseas and do this and do that, but you can always say something that will help somebody. I believe that everybody has an opportunity to say something to help somebody every day. Yeah. Every day. Even if it's no more than just acknowledging that uh, their, their hair looks good. Their nails look good. 
sharp shoes, whatever. You know, because y'all know how we do. We, we spend time putting ourselves together. And it would, be, um, it would be nice when we spend time to put ourselves together that somebody acknowledges that we do look good. <laughs> or you look nice. So here he's talking about things. One of the things that we were saying is that, number one, he asked himself some questions. The, the steward asked himself some questions. And, and today I want to talk to you about what's your plan. Look at your neighbor and just ask them, well, what's your plan? <laughs> you just don't wake up and just live. Don't wake up and keep doing the same thing. What's your plan? Everybody is in some place that they don't want to be. Not saying that it's a bad place, but you don't want to be there because you know that there's something better out there and some other place that you can arrive at that's better than where you are right now. My question is, well, what's your plan? And that's the first thing he did. The steward began to talk to himself and ask himself some questions. He said that, listen, here's my present situation. My present situation is that this king or the rich man said that I am going to lose my stewardship. And then he asked the question, now what am I going to do? He questioned himself, what am I going to do? He began to also recognize that he had a glimpse of his future because of what his past was. The rich man said, you will no longer be a steward which indicate in your future, you will not have this position that you're in, but it's all based on what he did in the past. In other words, sometimes we have to sit down and think, what did we do in the past that caused us to get to where we are today? And that is sometimes pronouncing what our future is going to be. You got to sit down and you got to think about what you have done. It has nothing to do with other people. It's what you have done. The next thing is that he gave some thought by thinking towards his resolve. He started thinking about, okay, now what can I do? And what should I do? Two different perspectives of thought. What can I do? And what should I do? With regards to this pronouncement of what his future is going to look like. If you don't like what your future is looking like from the seat that you're in, change it. It's not that deep. Ask somebody else, amen, ask them, well, what's your plan? <laughs> because if you don't have a plan, what you see is what you're going to get. We see that he came up with a plan in case one, uh, he came up with a plan that caused him to avoid being ashamed. If you go to chapter number 14, it talks about Jesus was saying this. He was saying that who, who goes out to warfare and don't look and see if he has enough enemy, I mean, power or men to conquer the enemy that's coming? Or who builds, goes to build a tower and don't, look at his assets to see if he has enough to finish. And, and so uh, you got to make sure that you have a plan that won't embarrass you when it's done. He came up with a plan to avoid, in his case, being ashamed. When you come up with your plan, there are certain things you want to avoid. You got to include that in your plan because you want to escape that. Whatever that is in your plan, you want to escape that. The next thing what he did was he took action. So he had this plan, but then after he had the plan, he didn't just sit on it. He, he didn't just say, I, I, okay. No, he created some action to his plan. And this is where laziness don't fit in with the change of your plan. Right Procrastination, there's no room for that if you want something to be different through a plan. Yeah. This is where you have to make yourself 
do what you see you should do apart from what other people are doing. I mentioned that before. You can't just let it have time. You have to make time for it. You have to make it happen in order for it to happen. Thinking for the purpose, and this is what a plan is, is thinking for the purpose to create actions to achieve a particular goal or result. Say it again. All right, I will. <laughs> Y'all know how we talk to each other, we talk to ourselves. A plan is thinking for the purpose to create actions to achieve a particular goal or result. That is what you're planning consist of what is going to be that goal or what is the result and what is going to be the action steps to make that a reality. And what you do, you pause to go through that process and then you implement it. Then it shows up the way you plan for it to show up. Now, uh, Jeremiah chapter number 29, verse number 11, some of you are familiar with that passage of scripture. It says this, this is God's way of thinking. He says, I know the plans I have for you. The first thing we want to note is the fact that God has plans. Amen. And in, in, in the fact that he has plans for us, why not us have plans for our lives? Amen. God planned for something else. We have plans for something else. Inclusively is our whole life a plan for our life. And in some of our cases, a plan for our finances, a plan for our health, a plan for our relationships, a plan for how we're going to succeed in some endeavor that we have. But we have to have and be like God, have plans for stuff. Amen. You know, uh, Lord's will, the Lord bless you with thousands of dollars income tax time next year. What's the plan for it? Okay, and you get this, and, and we all been there. If you don't plan for it, what you would do, you would get it and you would go through it and then you would look back and say, what did I do with all that money? But if you have a plan for it, then it's what we call earmark money. That means that this money, when we get it, it is going to be designated to accomplish a certain goal or plan that we put in motion and you do it without emotions affecting your judgment because sometimes when we get the money in our hand, our emotions set in there and detour us from the plan. Amen. This is why you make the plan before you get the money. Amen. Turn to somebody and tell them I'm going to make the plan make the before I get the money. Get the money. <laughs> Earmark it with a plan. Same thing with your health. Whatever that goal is, then you want to earmark certain things to make that happen. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. I think that's a good place to shout right there, right there. <laughs> you mean to tell me that God got plans? that he has plans to prosper us. And, and so if he has plans to proper, prosper us, then we have to create plans to get in sync with his prosperity. God says, I got plans to prosper you and not to do you no harm. So God is not trying to ruin or mess up anything in your life. He's trying to get you to another place other than where you are. And it would have a sense of prosperity to it. Plans that give you hope and a future. These are the elements of God's plans for us. So in some cases, we need to create plans that have the same kind of elements. A plan that we're going to end up prospering. Because here's the thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the book of the Philippians. It, he's, it says something like that. It is God that works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. When you come up with a plan, knowing that God has plans, then what God has opportunity now to do is to get your plan sync with his plan. 
But if you don't have a plan at all and God got a plan, then you may be doing things contrary to the plan of prosperity that he has designated for you. When you create the plan, God has opportunity to sync your plans. In other words, God has opportunity to say certain things that you didn't think about to include in your plan. And this is how he integrate his plan and your plan so that there's one plan. For it is God who worketh in you to will. He didn't say it is God who works on you. But he works in you. There's an individual by the name of Jonah. God worked on him. So he's not trying to work on you. He's trying to work in you. Work in you to will. But before you can will to do something, you have to have a base of knowledge to know what to do. God is working on you to increase your knowledge so that he can work his will into you that you would be willing to do what you know is right to be done. And when you know it's right to be done, he will work in you the will or to will and to do what you know is right to be done. Because that's where we get stuck sometimes. We get into the knowing we know what is right to be done, but we find it strange and we find it difficult to actually will to do it, to want to do it. But this is what the scripture says, that God will work in you the willingness to do it. In other words, you don't want to submit right now, but he will cause you to submit. I think it was somewhere in the scripture it says that if you're willing and obedient, somebody know what will happen? You'll eat the best of whatever has to happen. You'll be on the top and not the bottom. You'll be coming in while other folks are going out. He said you'll have the best if you're willing and obedient to what I want you to do. And this is all coming through what we consider to be a plan. Now, Proverbs chapter number 21, verse number five, New Living Translation says this, good planning and hard work leads to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts leads to poverty. In other words, if you try to skip the process and you try to shortcut the method of making certain things happen, it's not going to work out. But if you work hard with a good plan, It says in Proverbs 21 and 5, New Living Translation, a good plan and hard work will lead to prosperity. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, the thing about this is that that verse actually brings out a contrast between prepared work and last minute stuff. It's a big difference when you're impulsive and you make snap decisions without planning or taking consideration what's going to be the consequence of this action. Snap uh, answers, uh, uh, decisions, and everything, these are the things we have to avoid through planning. Plan what you're getting ready to do. How many many know what you're going to eat tonight? These are planners. (laughs) They're sitting in church getting the word of God, but they already know what they're going to feed their stomach. (laughs) Taste buds are already ready because there's a plan involved. Notice this. Uh, Let me me read a little bit here. Um, Let's go to um, Luke 16 and verse number four. He says, I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Now, notice the word receive. I'm reading from the King James Version. He said, now, I am resolved what to do. In other words, what he's saying is, in my plan, I'm going to create something so they can receive me when this thing comes down. Now, what he has done, he has anticipated receivership. He anticipated receivership. 
You see, through your plan, you can anticipate receivership. That whatever you're going after, they won't tell you no, but they will tell you yes. Anticipating receivership. That when you go out to do something based on your credit and your credit may not be what they want it to be because you have a plan and it's a plan that is included to prosper and God has a plan for the same thing, then God knows how to touch the person's heart so that they can receive what you have if you don't have what they want. This man created a plan for receivership. And there's a lot of things that have come against us as obstacles that were saying to, to all of us in some kind of way, you can't come in here. You, you can't have this. And no, you cannot do this. But when you actually create the plan where God will get you in sync with his plan to prosper you, then that plan would also include an anticipation that it's going to work out this time. Whatever has failed in the past, don't give up on it. Don't give up on it. Don't get paralyzed by failure or rejection. With this new plan, turn to somebody and tell them, I got a new plan now. First it was, what's your plan? Now it's, I got a new plan now. <laughs> In your plan, you're using your faith to anticipate receivership. In other words, his plan changed how they viewed him. And that's what's going to happen. God is going to help us and have a plan to arrive at a plan that whatever we're going after, they're going to see us different from the way they seen us before we had a plan. In other words, God's going to make you look good. He's going to make you look good. When you communicate, God's going to make you sound good. Anytime that the word of God says that God can make you like a wise man, then he can make you look good and sound good. Don't, don't count God out in your plan because he knows how to make it happen. So what we see here in, in chapter number four, verse number four, it says, he says, I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's servants or debtors unto him. And he said unto them unto the first one, how much do you owe my Lord? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then said he to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write down four score. Now, four score, um, every score is a 20. So he says, you owe a hundred, but write down 80. And as I mentioned to you before, what he did was in his plan, he swapped the indebtedness. He swapped the indebtedness. Whereas they did owe the Lord, now they owe him something. It's called a favor. Anybody ever ask for a favor? <laughs> yeah. It's a favor. So he used his present situation to swap some things so that he could have favor in his future. That they would receive him. Then it says this, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. That is the issue. God wants us to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. It's designated for us to be wise people, wise Christians, wise men and wise women. We do not live our lives just to exist. We're supposed to model wisdom. That when people look at your life and they see your accomplishments or they see what you endeavor to do and how it comes to pass and how successful you are and all the things that's working on your behalf, 
they ought to see some wisdom in your life. Some wisdom in your lifestyle. To the degree they want to they wanna associate with you. Because they want to know what is it that you know that I don't know to get you to where you are that can help me to get from where I am to where you are. And so that's what they try to do. They should try to tap into your wisdom. Should be. Jesus says that the Lord commended him because he had done wisely. Then it goes, for the sons of this age are in their generation wiser than the sons of light. Just, this is Jesus yet talking. He says, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends by means of the money of unrighteousness. King James Version may say mammoth, but it's in turn money. He says, after he gave the parable, he said, now what you all ought to do, children of God, is to make friends with the money of unrighteousness. Notice that he was first talking about the issue of stewardship and the waste and everything, and now after the parable is over, he makes his final statement about how wise he did. Now he's talking to us saying, this is what you need to do with your money. You need to make friends with the unrighteous money. I say it so many times, money is not meant to be spent. Is meant to get you to a certain place. Money answers all things. It will open doors for you. It will turn no's into yes. Y'all, y'all see how the situation was, you know, with folks in, in the movies. They go to the restaurant. They have no reservations. And then the guy pull out some money. And we see, oh, there is a table here. Money answers a lot of things. When you go into a place, any kind of place, if you look like money, they give you a certain level of respect. They don't know whether you have it or not, but you just look like you have it. (laughs) Jesus began to say, listen, I want you to make friends by means of the money of unrighteousness that when it fails, they may receive you into everlasting habitation. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, money is not necessarily promising. There will be some times where you will have it, and then there will be some times where you will not have as much as you used to have. For whatever the reason, and he talked about that wasted and all that stuff before, but when you have it, then, as we stated, you want to make sure that it's going in the right places. That if you ever come short of it, whoever it is and whatever it is, is still going to receive you. This is the use of money. In other words, what he's talking about is creating a balance between your spiritual life and your money. He says here, verse number 11. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous money, in other words, if you have not done well with the money that you had, who will commit to you the true or trust you with the true riches? Now, now we know money will, quote, unquote, make you rich. But Jesus is saying that there's another level of riches that is different from money. And what we strive to do, we strive to make a lot of money. But Jesus is saying there's another level of riches riches that has nothing to do with money. And this is what we need to strive for and not the money. He said, who will give you the true riches? Now, the true riches come from the revelations of God. When God gives you a revelation then that is something that has been hidden to, uh, from other people. And he reveals it only and only exclusively for you. And that's a true richness. <clears throat> Rich, because what he would do, whatever revelation God gives you, he will make things line up with that revelation. Even if the stuff is all whacked up. 
When God gives you something that he will do or that he will make happen, he will make it happen. And the thing about it is you don't have to sweat because when he makes it happen, he makes it happen for you exclusively. So you don't have to worry about somebody else getting your stuff. Don't worry about it. A hundred people are going to be going after the same thing. But when God gives you a revelation about it, then you need to rest and relax. Because I don't care who, how many people are going after it, it's mine. Let's go to verse number 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you that which is your own? And I, I like that because what it means is that we have to take care of everything we have. Take care of everything you have. All your possessions. All your assets, all of your uh, possessions, take care of it. I was talking to, and I'm, a, I'm not throwing you under the bus, Brother Keith. Oh, maybe I, yeah, I was not talking to you. I was talking to one of the younger guys, younger than Brother Keith there. He had told me he had just got a new car. I got a car. I said, good. That's good. I said, well, uh, pop your trunk. Let me see. <laughs> and what my point is that when you pop people trunk, you will see how they're taking care of their car. If it's a whole lot of stuff, they're making the inside look good. But behind the curtain is a whole different world. This is what we have a tendency to do. We want the outside to look good. We want people to see us in a good light. But people are not the judge. They're not the judge of whether you approve, not approve, you're good, you're not good. This is what you have to be responsible for for yourself. If you like a certain kind of house and a certain kind of level in the house and uh, cars and property and all that, I was, I was talking to my wife and I was saying how that when we were coming up, uh, we were taught how to take care of other people's property. This is what Jesus is talking about. If you're not faithful in taking care of your own, uh, somebody else's, who's going to give you your own? And, and so when we get started, we all get started into something and we don't own whatever it is that we get. It's either leased, it's borrowed, or whatever it is, but it depends on how you take care of what you have. Whether God is going to bless you so you can have your own. If you're renting somebody's house, take care of it. If you're leasing a car, take care of it. Wherever and whatever you have, be faithful at taking care of it. And then this is what the Word of God says, that if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who's going to eventually give you that which is your own? Verse number 13, no servant can serve two masters. Now, what he's bringing out is that, and he's talking about money, right? What he's saying is money is a master. In other words, money is a God. And any time that that God, money, start telling you what to do to increase it, you want to be careful about that. Because the God of money will tell you, do this. Go there. Do this. Do that. Uh, you know, and I'm not trying to say this to incriminate anybody. I'm just letting you know right now. But if you're working five days a week, and then all of a sudden that God of money says you need to work seven days a week, and you need to miss church, if that God of money tells you that, then you need to be very mindful who's talking to you about that. What you're kind of implying is that 
I don't need God to help me to meet all my needs. So I'm going to help meet my own needs by sacrificing my spiritual environments. Now, you all know that when we were younger and, and didn't have so much stuff that we had to do in life that we spent more time in prayer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we spent more time in the word of God. Yes. We spent more time coming to church. Yes. We did more time growing spiritually so because we didn't have all the, the distractions, the demands of our lives. But as time went on, all those things crowded in and what it did was begin to suffocate different spiritual levels of our lives. I, I was praying on the way here today, Lord, increase the spiritual discernment of your people for this church. I'm, I'm not praying for them other folks in somebody else's church. I'm praying for y'all. Increase the spiritual discernment because this is a vital part of your spiritual growth is how you discern stuff when they come your way. If you don't know the source of what comes your way, it may seem like it's a good thing, but it's of the devil. It may appear to be right, but it's of the flesh. Yeah. And all this comes from your discernment. I need the church, uh, Deeper Life Gospel Center, to increase their discernment, these spiritual things, and not get robbed by the God of money, Amen. of spiritual stuff. <laughs> Notice what he said here. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other. This is the resolve that God wants us to have. He wants us to hate the God of money, but love him. But notice what he says also. Or else he will hold to the one. In other words, hold on to God and just despise the God of money. God wants us to hate the God of money. In other words, we don't do any and everything for money. We don't do any and everything just because money is being dangled in front of us. We, we do not obey the God of money. We obey our living God, Jesus the Christ, his father. I want to challenge you to create your plan. Not to become stagnant in certain areas of your life. Because there's a bright future for you. There's some new things that God wants to do in your life. And there's some changes that God wants to make show up in your life. And one way in which he can do it is to help us to be wise stewards. Ask your neighbor, just ask him, do you have your plan? Don't give no answer, because I want you lying in church. <laughs> Don't give no answer. It's rhetorical. It's rhetorical. All right. Stand on your feet with me. Hallelujah. There is a plan. A plan to prosper us. A plan to do us no harm. A plan to give us hope in a bright future. And we're gonna do this, saints. We're gonna change. Come around next year, we're not gonna be in the same place. We're not gonna be in the same place. That's not gonna happen. At the beginning of the year, we had you to write down on index cards debt that you wanted to have eradicated. I've been praying over those cards, and I have them on my desk. I've been praying over them, praying for them. I can't wait until, well, I can't wait, uh, until the end of the year, we're going to put those cards, because they were anonymous. We're going to put those cards out there. And I need you to see that 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 you wrote down has now been answered. You will know it, because don't nobody else know what it is you wrote down. But we're serving a God that wants to keep us changing and keep us moving in the things he has prepared for all of us. And I believe with all my heart, if we're willing, that God is going to make it happen. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Wasn't that an awesome word? Yes, it's like they were 
talking directly to me. We hope you enjoyed the service just as much as we did. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And here at Deeper Life, we have several ways that you can give. Through PayPal, Cash App, Givelify, Give Plus, and you can visit dlgc.org and click the online giving tab. Or you can text your donation to 313-486-0685. Thank you for continuing to support our ministry. This is Pastor Wade Bell. I'm the pastor of Deeper Life Gospel Center. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of our service on today. And I am encouraging you and I am inviting you to come on and be a part this Thursday at 7 o'clock as we have interactive Bible study. If you have not experienced that, then you need to be a part of what we're getting ready to do this Thursday at 7 o'clock. Facebook Live or www.dlgc.org watch live tab. This is Pastor Bell. See you soon.